uh, get it right or anything. But if we were to bring it to the 21st century, what would we do? We've got to kill that monitoring thing, right? Because that's called monitoring process. So we have to do something to this monitoring thing. That has to be killed. What children basically acting as one, that has to be killed. So there's a problem here. All children, but doesn't it show you that the teacher sitting on the mat with a book and children all looking at the teacher and at the book and um, guessing what's in the book and playing with that book? It's the same model. We're all working together to get the thing, but the to get the thing or whatever is the object of learning, the way that pleases the teacher. But if you have this model, how do you account that little, little joys got it? Just because the whole chorus of classrooms said something or whatever, how do you, how do you make sure that little joys can actually do things? Or oh, because we ask her to recognize two words. As, she, as we were analyzing the text. So what? A chimpanzee can do it. A chimpanzee can do it. It doesn't take her into the 21st century print culture. You need to know first what is it that you intend. And then ask yourself, am I allowing little Joyce to get there? Just because Joyce, I mean, I've seen it in accelerated literacy, just because Joyce finally got some things in some sentence doesn't make her a critical literacy person. You need to define what is it that you're after. So we need to kill this idea that students all work together to get the meaning right so that the teacher is placed. That kind of unison of all working as one. That will be the day. It's like a prison. It is. Foucault, Michael Foucault, you, this is well beyond you, calls it panopticon. It's a prison model, panopticon. Everybody knows about it. Well, I don't know. Panopticon. Not everybody. Everybody who's in critical lit uh, theory. Panopticon is that you've got the watcher. Not only you've got the watcher watching you, but you also have students watching one another. Oh, you didn't say it right. You have to be like this. Oh, you didn't say it right. It has to be like this. There's no creativity. There's no being different. Are, are children allowed to produce to a rap version of the book? Or, or something else? There's no room here. We need to change it. So we need to remove the teacher as a monitor. We have to do something to this one book that is the source of everything. And we need to remove this thing that all students are working as one. And of course, critical theories, I have mentioned that before here, they call it the congregation model. The priest reads the book and children behave. Not and the, 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 the understanding that children are performing well is not because they are creative, critical, they have self-awareness and all of that. It's because they produce behavior that the teacher takes off. So in a church situation, you might not understand the sermon and all the things. Why is the ceremony the way it is? You don't understand. I mean, it just, we go there and we receive it and we become part of it, but we don't know the entire history. We don't know what generated this particular protocol, but all we are asked is to behave. And that is that they call it a congregation model. The teacher teaches the priest reads out the book, and everybody behaves the way they should respond to that particular reading. Surely we can do better than that. So unfortunately, there's no other model proposed in a graphic form by anyone other than Anya Lyon, so we just have to go to my model. Because it's hard. It's really hard to break from this. We can criticize it, but Mark, McCorm, uh, uh, Phil Cormack criticizes it, but he doesn't produce an alternative. Because it's hard. 
It is so entrenched. We know that doesn't exist. We know that shouldn't do that. And yet we kind of subliminally accept it. So if shouldn't be there a book, there should be many books. That's how you work. This is how you work with principles. You may not know the model that you will end up with, but you know that you have to kill one book, so put many books. You have no idea why at this very moment, but put many books. I'm teaching you how to think, right? And that's how I write my papers. I write them from principles. I have no idea what will be the outcome. I'm always surprised. So we might remove the teachers. The students, we don't want them to work as one. So we just put one student. In my model, I put a student and I give a, vari a student plus maybe a team. There should be a room because what I want is team building and a dialogue, right? Because I want children to talk. I want two different dialogues to happen. One is internal in your head. But the other one is with the students, because students will also allow you to be the, they become your sprint, uh, what, what do you call it? The, the, um, another voice, another tool to see how you are doing. So we have stu student here, just one student or maybe a team, so a group. Many books, a group. And so, so then we can draw arrows. So children or a thing are looking or a team are looking into the books. Why are they looking for a book to into those books? Why would you do that? Why am I asking why? Because why is very important. We don't do things without purpose. So why is always the question to ask. Why would you do that? Because we, the principle of our understanding about human action is that it's always purposeful. So why would they be doing looking into these different books? To learn is not a bad actually word. Because they have particular thing to do. And they want to have a look. They want to learn how to do it best. Does this remind you of something we've done in these classes so far? This is not the full model. This is half of a model. But even the half of a model, if we leave it here, what does it remind you of? Yeah, like what did we talk before? Like where? That is true, but the tools will be here. These are your sources. The tools will be here. So forget about the tools at this very moment, but it is about actually learning how to do the task best. When did we do that? We did it last week. Okay, so what I did with you, I was dragging assignment one and assignment two at the same time through these lectures so that you can connect them together, especially since they are so close in timelines to each other. One is like 2nd of May and the other one is like three or four weeks later. You got these pre-literate children or literate children, I don't mind, whatever, and you seduce them into the game of playing, recording themselves and so on. But once they committed themselves and they have this, what we call an audio book, then what did we do? We wanted them now to, to compare themselves how they were doing with that audio book. So we checked how the Chinese people start a story. We checked how the Aboriginal people start a story. We checked how the... English start different stories, children's stories, different types of stories, right? So now 
once they have their audiobook and they have it they have internalized what they were doing so you see the teacher didn't come to the class and thought to himself we're gonna do an audiobook <laughs> right and this is the first step no it's different we allow them to play and then we, we could also and then we'll do it next week but we could then also show what they can do with this particular recording they did with computer but let's assume they chose an audio book so then once they actually record once they once they recorded that thing and they want to see it as an audio book we can then show them now we can start playing with them imagine they are your children it really helps because very often we're different to children in school because we think that the curriculum is above us but if you actually think of the kids in class as if they were your children you actually start doing it right so you get them into explore that welcome hello my name is Bob and this is my book so you explore the welcome so you explore different covers of books so then they can have hello my name is Michael and this is my book now being a recorded voice but put on the cover that they draw themselves after having explored different covers and see what analyzing review what different covers achieve what effect and then they pick one for themselves or create a new thing or whatever you see it's that exploratory you cannot understand what is a cover of the book until you actually compared and contrasted the functions and the and the how-to of different ones and then gradually you grow your own precise understanding what the cover of a book does and it's very different than emerging in the classroom and focusing them on the cover of the book very different because then you make the cover of a book a learning thing whereas here the cover of the book is not a learning thing what it is we're learning how to make a audio book now yeah what are we learning presentable polished lovely why am i doing this because what the model is still missing is why the heck are we doing this and what it's missing is the audience haven't drawn it yet so it's out of the world in order to do something wonderful to impress the world and that's Paulo Freire which is this is the world word and the world again from the world that's why compare and contrast you create something let's call it a word and then you give it back to the world and it becomes the history of that world and you know how even a little audio book created by your little preliterate child a student becomes the history of the world do you know how it becomes because that child is part of that future so whatever they do in your class that becomes internalized history and as a result that which is in the past is no longer there it is your kids that start creating the future so as you can see the job of a teacher especially in, in literacy classes is very important but it is not important because we want children to recognize words so that they can read the building instruction form but because we create the history and these histories will create the world that will be so you can see in this model that is not very well drawn because I'll just leave it because you have mem uh, related to it there is no teacher who monitors the function of the teacher is now here
and that's just well beyond this class at this very moment, but to put, to, to make the task such that it is creative, and so it's creative, enables, and it will be creative only when it allows exploration for children to make a decision, which means critical thinking is involved. Why would I do that? Why would my cover look this way or that way? Right? So the knowledge that you have, you bring into the classroom, is not telling them what to learn, but the kind of decisions that you will make about the things they will be comparing and contrasting, they are too small, or they don't have access enough, or enough literacy skills, or it is just too hard to find all the examples at once on the internet. Either way, what I'm saying is, when you create your resources for your classes, have those, for example, in this case, in the very first part of the activity, when you start actually making them compare their work with other things, how to make it better, and you introduce it as how to make it better, because we're going to present it or they're going to put it on the school website or whatever, you make informed choices. So you don't bring all the English examples so that the girl from Hong Kong feels deficient. You might even, if you were me, you might even bring, uh, when you actually, once you cover the audio, the, 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 the cover, and you go to the introduction of the book, and they do the same, compare and contrast, and then they choose. In order for children to choose, you want them to choose the mood. How, does, how the story starts, what's the, what's the song of a story, what's the rhythm, what's the mood of it? Is it going to be in the bed, out of the bed, right? Completely different feeling than, and now I'll tell you the story. Now, you could actually do it in various languages. Because when you don't understand words, it's easier for you to focus on the intonation and the mood. This also legitimizes children from different countries, legitimizes their languages. What it also does, it starts internationalizing your children's understandings of selves. Well, because when you raise in one country, one culture, one village, one parent, one mother and father and all of that, the world is very simple. And then when you grow up, people say to you, you have to, you have to get out of your comfort zone. And you say, well, it was all right. It worked. And who proved it that it worked? The environment you had. You do it from the beginning. The world is bigger than that. So the children will be, when you go to things, so, so what I'm saying is the teacher's role here is to be smart in the way you make, you make selections of things, in the way you make them accessible, in the kinds of tools you give children to explore, whatever text you put here, I call them books here, but it could be anything, whatever text you put there for children to explore. You need to be smart there and, and do it in an informed way. So your role is as a smart, a person who actually can ask a smart question, but not by pointing a finger and asking a child, but by giving them choices and putting tools in place so that, so that they can actually use those tools to answer their own questions. It's very engaging, that class. And why it's engaging? Because you may room for personal histories. 
ask anyone else why their classes or their formats are engaging. And I will bet that very often people will not be able to actually define what engagement means. Because in that monitoring model, they just put it there right at the end as a descriptor. There is no proof of it. Whereas here, we have everything consistent. You make room for individual histories so that they become increasingly precise, those children, with their choices. And they can only become increasingly precise if they explore what they know against other examples and in teams. And here you go. All that critical is through exploration. Creative is because they're doing things. Uh, Self-awareness, it's because they are exploring their own understandings, how they actually are faring in the social world. Um, social awareness, they're learning about, because I'll, I'll give you some tools for it, they will be learning about why different things are done in different contexts, for what purposes. That will happen to us, uh, that's topic for the next few weeks. They do team building because they not only team together, but what they do, they start teaming up with other people for whom they actually are doing these things. As I said, be it children in the hospital or um, other kind of older people and so on, they're learning, they're getting an awareness of their community. Part of the resilience building is actually to be aware that you are a member of the community you belong. And very often these children, not very often, I actually will say very often, are stuck in families which are not necessarily they are either busy or not happy. And when we don't give them this, this idea of actually doing things for others, it's not trivial. It looks like an lion in action, but it isn't. Because those children have to actually, when they live in these families where people are maybe less happy or very busy, that's all they know. And they judge their capabilities in relation to how they are accepted by their family. And often they just treat it as a commodity or, you know, there are examples of very unpleasant situations. But that's at home. But then there is a world outside of the home. And how do you introduce it in a way that they connect to that world? That's why schools have community partners, but community partners very often is understood make parents read the book to the child. We can do better than that. Community partners can link up with communities and Red Cross and uh, Aging uh, Council, Council on the Aging and all of that, bring, bring children to the world out there that needs them. People are bored. My mother who barely can sing and tell a joke she does lots of it. Uh, when she was, dare I say, my age, I can't believe it. <laughs> to me, when I was your age, she seemed old. But my mother took on a new profession. Well, she wasn't paid for it. She joined with some other bored people together. They created a cabaret. My loser mother. And then they went to, I don't know how my mother had that, invented that, but they went to every aged care home in their city, and it's a big city, and where all the people were gathering and sometimes disabled and so on. And they were singing to them the songs of their childhood. And my mother, when you put my mother on the stage, she will never shut up. She will just talk jokes day and night. I don't know how she could do it. I used to pay her to shut up. <laughs> She do it at night. I would like to sleep sometime. Anyway, it was amazing. An amazing experience. My mother said, these older people, Anya, were crying. Little children can produce tutorials, how to use computers or how to use particular things. Produce little videos for all the people. It's not that an older person will use them or not. It's just sweet. It's, it has the same value as when I, was, when I started washing up at home. My mother said, after you washed up, we had to wash up after you. But it was nice to see. 
So the word doesn't have to be Einstein style, just a gesture. But what happens is when children produce these things and they get letters from HQ Center, it was lovely. Has the child who at home is abused, has that child feeling? I was part of it. But what we need to do is start to actually make children aware that their life doesn't depend on two people in the house. You can see what we did to this reading lecture, lecture on how to teach children read. It's, it's more than just read. It's how to be in the world and how, to, how we can actually open the gates for children. And they, with curiosity, look how people do things and why and uh, what they do, why they do that, when they do this, how they do this. You know, then we give them tools to explore these things on their own terms, so that and and according to the questions that are prompted by the thing they actually want to do, which is the task, a project. A project. So they explore. They do read, but they don't read because today we today we're doing the caterpillar. Next week we will be doing the big brown dog. Next day we will be doing. It is just so boring. I mean, I'm not saying there's no room for it. I, you'd have to explain to me and make a case for me that that there's a place for it. I can't see a place for it. So maybe now and then for a change, you can throw in the grandmother sitting on the mat, as with children sitting on a chair and doing the mat reading. Now and then, maybe, I don't know. But there is, we are not babysitters. We have to expand children's perspectives and world. So exploratory learning with tools, enabling them to learn with these, let's call them texts, in a way that suits, helps them to perform the project according to how they understand the audience. We open the gates to the community and social awareness, community awareness and self-awareness and self-confidence is growing. And what will you be assessing if you were to ask me? Well, the items of the points of focus that students will be exploring will be the things you will be looking for in the assessment. So it's not necessarily whether they can replicate, but whatever, oh, this is the topic for next lectures, but whatever you actually enable them to explore, whatever intention you had, so when, for example, we have covered at this very moment how to start the book, the, the book cover, and how to, how to start the story, well, you will be looking whether the book cover is actually expressing the mood of the book, and it's consistent with the mood of the starting of the story, not whether they can read and write once upon the time. Very different. Now you actually are assessing their critical thinking and their creativity to, together. And their community awareness because it's going to HK people. Is it going to talk to those people? And so on. Now you realize that they are 5, 6, 7, 8. So you're not judging them. This is not X factor. So I'll finish here. Um, but I didn't make a point that I wanted to make last week. Remember, but I did make it in the online lecture because I added a slide when I was actually putting it up there. What is not text? Remember how we were looking at the social capital, uh, what other capital was there? Ca educational, social, and symbolic capital. And we were saying that this person was singing in Spanish and there were reasons for it. These are the texts in which his performance was embedded. These are texts. 
This room is a text. Why are you sitting there? Because you know the protocol. The protocol is a text. I'm sitting here, you're sitting here, Aranya. Every, a lot of very, very famous people who changed this world would tell you everything is a text. A human being is a storyteller and everything you see is a point of view and a point of view is a text. You read everything as you live. And you know it because you, in your assignments very often write to me, we read the street, we read people's faces, we read situations. You can't read a situation until you have seen many of them. Otherwise, it's a blur. So I didn't make that point. So the text, what is the text? Well, in a sense, what is not the text? Everything is a text. So what is it that we're reading? We're learning to actually read how we can act, which is the word, in the world. And in order to do that, we have to explore the world. We can't learn how to be in the world without exploring the world. And one book ain't gonna give us the world. What it's giving us is a training tool no different than the software to train the chimpanzee to recognize words. Right? So everything is a text. Everything is a text. It's the word. So now children have to actually be able to participate in those texts. In order to participate in those texts, which is the world, which is future or current, they have to actually explore, explore the world. So they will have to have tools enabling them to explore the world. And whatever tools I will give you, I would have loved to say to you, they Anya Lyon, but someone listened to my presentation in Asia and they said to me, oh, Anya, that's John Dewey. I was broken hearted because I thought I invented the model, but I'm very happy that someone else thought about it before me as well. So I'll give you the model as the lectures are going to um, ensue. Okay. So you can see when you are starting to plan your activities for assignment two, does this, lect this lecture gives you pretty good methodology how to start. You don't start with learning outcomes for year one because that's a Woolworths method. Today I do sugar and tomorrow I do triangles or whatever, flour. You start with uh, an activity with, with a project. You might start two-stage project, which is like we did. First, you seduce children to allow them to play with tools. And then you explore with them what they can do with their final product to make it better for someone else to be received as meaningful and wonderful. And then you will find out, and we will do it in class, that when you do that, you will see how many learning outcomes in the curriculum you have covered without ever ever reading them to the point that you actually devise the activity based on three outcomes. Today we do three, tomorrow we do five. To be really controversial, I remember how, uh, remember how the Queensland Basics has, has, um, had come in and they had this, uh, what did they call it? I used to be so good at it. Um, the construction of the syllabus or curriculum which had connectedness, depth, um, what was it there? Like four principles they had. And people were doing research but they, and they said, oh, we were checking just two principles. And I'm thinking, it's not what works. You either have them all or you have none. Each of them is just a synonym, synonym of the other, but just shows a different dimension of it. And the same with curriculum. With the curriculum, they, they're not a shopping basket. They are synonyms of the same thing, which is explicating what it means to read the world. And that's what you need to teach, is how, how to work in this text-based world. Text-based, not just printing, but also how to read situations, how to understand the genre, how to understand the protocols to be used, and all of that. So.
that's the objective, which, and that's how the curriculum actually, in my view, should be read. As everything or nothing. You can't teach them to be critical but not creative. They're just synonyms. In order to be creative, you have to make choices. In order to be critical, you have to make choices. But you can't make choices unless someone allows you to be creative, because otherwise, what's the point of making choices? It's just different dimensions of the same thing. Team building, well, in order to you, do, you create these choices, in order to respond to the world. As a result, you, you, show your, you develop your social capabilities. But in order to respond to the world, you actually are using explorations of self. How do I read this world? Self-awareness is growing. You can see how all of this is one. That's part two of today's lecture, right? So if you want to review it, that will be in part two of today's lecture week seven. All right, we might finish. I see you after Easter. Not that most of you care. You're just gonna hook on the holiday and have a great time. Because <laughs> some of our students actually are not. Easter, Easter bound. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. See you next week. Not to you.